Hello, uh, my name is James Hummel. I'm here to talk about the MBSC ecosystem and what that means. My background is safety critical, mission critical systems. Uh, and with that, I had to do modeling. And so I worked for engine controls doing modeling for level A certification. Um, after that, I worked as a consultant for uh, companies like Boeing uh, doing integrations for tools and building environments for them to do their modeling. So I spent the last more than 20 years doing a modeling of some sort within UML, SysML, uh, some form, shape, or other. Worked on many committees over the years, uh, the OMG, uh, to work on the specification for what they're doing uh, for these languages, the RTCA, which is for aerospace and defense, and how to define how software and modeling is acceptable uh, for the environments. And of course, we're working at the INCOSI uh, working groups. I'm gonna go through, uh, basically I've got three sections within here. I'm gonna talk about what is it that we're trying to get out of the tools? What is it that we wanna do with our environments and what are we trying to do with it? What is the tool vendors providing to us right now? What's the current state of all this stuff? Even the definitions of what we think we want to do. What's the data? Uh, what's the tools? And then I'm going to go through the integration solutions. What type of uh, things do we, are available to us to make these all work together or not? Desired outcomes. I'm going to specifically focus towards uh, SysML specifically, but I'm t in general I'm talking about the whole MBSC or MBC solutions. But we're going to go through that, and I'll talk about out impact analysis, outcomes, system engineering, communication paths, and point of view. For the last, you know, 20 years, I've been trying to pay, take people from a document-centric point of view to a model-centric point of view to make sure that we can show the same things we've always done within the document forms, but then I'm going to show it in a modeling form to get a better visualization of that information and the relational relationships between the pieces that you have and be able to... to visualize everything that you're trying to do instead of having a, just a document that you have to read through. MBSE is actually the formalization of the entire support system, requirements, design, analysis, verification, validation. It's the entire thing. SysML is just a piece of that. SysML fits and threads through in and out of all those different uh, elements to support an MBSE solution, but it's MBSE is not SysML. SysML is a piece of MBSE. So SysML specifically, is, and I'll focus a little bit more on that because it's the language and the tools and the tool vendors, and I'll show you from their point of view um, what we're doing and how we're threading all this stuff together. SysML is a design language. It's, it's extensible. It allows you to add your own domain-specific language, and in that, you can actually extend the language beyond just calling something a block. You can call it something more specifically to have a meaning for you, and then that could be a specific type of thing. It's not a process, it's not meant for that. It's not really meant either to help you do graphical user interfaces and layouts. And it's not a CAD tool, but it integrates to CAD. And it definitely does a linkability or syncability to get that data and uh, connectivity up. Model-based system engineering is weaving that fabric and we're using SysML to help us do that, that weaving. It's key in, in helping you, for, to give you that middle piece to take all the different tools and disciplines and put them all together. You might have heard of digital thread, fabric, tapestry, digital twin. Those are all just the different keywords that are talking about the same thing. It really is the ecosystem of the data, the ecosystem of the tools. What do you have? How do you thread all this stuff together? How do you know if you change one thing, what does it impact? So you pull in these threads and you look at the tapestry to see all the other pieces that you have to go and at least analyze at a minimum. Some outcomes that you can that you typically want to do as a system engineer is that I need to make sure that I have these types of data collected, data gathered, and data reported within the SysML environment. So specifically, I'm, I'm focusing towards SysML. What can we capture and what's there? And then what's shared between the other tools when we're doing some of this stuff when we're talking about it. You know, sometimes I say that I'm gonna capture what the user's needs are. And also, my, some people might go and document that within the requirements tools that are out there and available for, so they capture all the user needs. Of course, you can do them all, the system all represent the same thing, and so they could be shared data between the two sets of things. Could be just I want to visualize what I'm seeing from my requirements tools. 
I want to go, I want to know the objectives that I'm trying to meet to know that I've got those needs met. And in that, I also have goals. And so I, I, with needs, I should have objectives and goals. Um, but I believe they should have objectives, goals, and then goals were tied to parameters in the system. To say that I've got a specific parameter I'm trying to meet, it's going to meet this goal. I've met that objective, which made that need. Of course, we can always, you know, system is built for doing system architecture, design, and interfaces. That's its, uh, uh, one of its core uh, beans, is to help you get a handle on your interfaces between your systems and uh, system, system design and your architecture. You can add a domain-specific language like FAMIA on top of this to capture failure modes, causes, effects. I can add another language on top of stakeholder value network so I can actually identify stakeholders, do calculations, do those uh, values. You want to do simulations. So you want to take and you want to do analysis. I want to do performance analysis. I need to make sure that I'm doing something to know what's happening and is it uh, what I've got in there uh, sufficient for what I'm trying to build. I need to generate a bill of materials uh, typically. So I can capture that information. Um, either I'm getting it from the CAD world or I'm going to be able to capture that and put that in my abstract model that I'm creating within SysML. And I want to do impact analysis. And of course, you're going to do that across the, the tools and say that I can, any given change, any one of these can capture that information. Any one of these should report that same information from their point of view. System engineering encompasses many disciplines. So as a system engineer, we have to know and, and communicate with mechanical engineering, sales and marketing, customer representatives, safety and engineering, reliability engineering, maintainability, manufacturing. Maybe you'll have to talk to this, uh, chemical and civil people, electrical engineering, definitely. Um, you're going to talk to your, with your software group. You have all these lines of communication that we need to make sure that you show these models and to all these different groups of people. They might have different tools that they're using to see the information and how they want to actually capture it and do it. Uh, you'll have your set of tools that you're going to be picking from. And, and other people might even have other things where they're capturing data and SAP or cost modeling. And you want to pull that stuff in so you can see it. But you're not going to restrict them to go and use your specific tool. You're going to let them use whatever tool they're they want to in their environment and be able to pull that data in and uh, view it, link it, do it, sync it, something. System engineering has many points of view that you want to look at this stuff. So I want to pull, pull a system model and put it together. And I might want to just see it from the architecture point of view. So I want to see all the architecture stuff and, and all the related interfaces, all they're going to look at there. I might look at it from a cost point of view. So I might want set of reports that show me all my cost, cost impact, change impact, uh, elements like that. I might want to see from a control system point of view, which means it's going to show the software people how to do their jobs. Uh, the electrical people, how to design the right layout so that the addresses are the right information so the software people can do their jobs. How do you know you have the right inputs and outputs that are the, of the control system? So it's going to be a different point of view of looking at this. I can look at failures. I can look at functions and simulation, change impact. There's many more. Right now, we're going to look at the data ecosystems that we have or, or that we're defining or talking about. We also look at the tools and what their ecosystems look like. Right now, if I'm thinking modeling environments, simplistically, I can say that I, I want to do requirements. I want to have a PLM. I've got to have a printed circuit board layout, maybe. I need to know those elements. I have to talk to software. I have to talk, uh, uh, I have to do some analysis. I have to do some simulation. I'm going to have some system conceptual des uh, design. And all these is my uh, basic level of information I have to do in my ecosystem. From the OMG, they're talking about the digital information exchange. So they've got this entire ecosystem that they're calling a, a digital engineering ecosystem, which has to do with uh, military or wanting to buy specific types of things from us. And they can go and look within a set of information to see who's providing what, to what standards are being met and what groups of people are, might be uh, uh, involved in that set of things down to where you can get into your sub suppliers and, and see who's providing what part and what piece. So they've got this digital engineering and it's going to be slices of this and, 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 and cross sections of that on how they actually want to see the world too. But how do you get all these things to work together? They even talk about this uh, provide an authoritative source of truth. And when I looked up that, I, I found that a digital thread talk at uh, Stevens Institute they're calling it the authoritative source of truth, which is really a distributed source of truth. Um, that 
I've got a set of people providing stuff. I've got a set of people who are defining what they want to have. I've got a set of people using that set of things. And there's a governance piece on how I actually uh, check in, check out, uh, make sure that everything's in the right spot where I need it, um, have some kind of elements where I can actually store the data. So I've got a central storage area. I've got the uh, source of truth here for failure modes and modeling. I've got uh, information I'm pulling in from the different disciplines. I've got what project and what products are going to be needed and when, what's the pr production of those. I've got digital models to be able to help us uh, uh, validate things and view things and what we want to see. So they have all these different things, but they're saying that there is no one set of truth. Um, for years, we talked about a single source of truth, and I always was taking it from different points of view, that I could take it from the PLM point of view, that I could be the single source of truth, and I can go out and get all the data, and you can look at, you can query one system, and it's going to have everything. Well, that was where we were duplicating all the data into one place, and then it just made it so that you had to worry about synchronization of, do you have the latest or not? Um, so single source of truth is not necessarily the right thing to think of. And it's always about the aspect of what's your really uh, source. Am I requirement centric? Well, maybe the requirements are the center part of the world. Am I model centric? Well, then my model, system model is going to be the center part of the world. And I'm going to ask it information. Or am I my PLM centric? Am I cost centric? Am I uh, a business centric? Their, their worlds are SAP and other, other things altogether. So they don't think of it the same way that we do, but they want the same information that we're all getting to. So I don't think there's anything such thing as a single source of truth, but there is definitely a authoritative source of truth where, they, where this information is coming from. Now, where they store it and all that information, that's fine. We can look at that and, uh, and try and figure that out. Tool ecosystem, well, I got this from uh, Nomadic, uh, their website. They talk about the tools that they interchange with within their modeling environment. This is just all the different tools out there in the world that they can pull information from, push information to, depending on where, where your focus is. If I'm working on requirements, I'm going to be working on requirements tools or maybe Excel. I might be an embedded engineer. I might be working in C, C++, or maybe an FMI that's going to generate stuff into MATLAB to generate code for me. I might be working in analysis simulation, and I've got different ways of uh, interfacing to that. I might be working in a product on engineering world or a PLM world, and I've got different uh, elements that I can pull and push in out of every one of those. Well, all these use some kind of integration. So we have to talk about what's the integrations between these different tools. Uh, what's the best way that we can get data to and from whatever we're trying to get it to and from? So the integration solutions. We have different integration types like STEP, which is a standards for exchange of product modeling data. XMI, XML, that's from the OMG. FMI, FMU, that's coming from Medallica. Um, the different tools have an API, an application program interface. And OSLC, or REST services, are uh, some of the solutions that might work. Uh, like these integrations, basically the step is a AP233, if we're talking the systems engineering data interchange format. It was released in 2012. XML, XMI, that came from the OMG. It's the extended markup language, or it's the XML metadata interchange uh, information between the data. The OMG did release a diagram definition in 2015 of June, but no tool vendor that I've seen yet has implemented that uh, standard. Um, it would mean that I could actually go and upload an XMI and XML to a common location, come along with any tool and be able to view and look at that set of data and be able to view those models, and it should be should be um, universal, but it's not yet. Uh, the functional mockup interface, well, that's how you can do information from like parametrics and SysML out to other tools. There's actually a whole language on how to do exchange of data that way. And all the tools have an application program interface, of course. And then there's open services for lifecycle collaboration, which is how we link information between the tools. So it has a linking capability versus the syncing capability of all the other stuff that we have here. So all the standards and its roadmap uh, it shows you that uh, I've got my OMG standards for you know like RecIF, SysML, and where they're going and how we're modifying them. We've got a SysML v2 coming out soon. Uh, then the vendor's going to implement that, and it'll probably take a year for each each vendor to give you some kind of a format or a function that you can have a tool to be able to do that. 
And then they're going to work on the, the version 3 that's going to be more integrated with the AP233 specification to be able to generate that information so you can see a standard data format of what we're doing. Likewise, we've got these other standards, the, uh, the ISO standards that you have here. Modalica is doing it so you can interchange your simulation modeling and uh, uh, functional information between the models. Um, I've got my linkage that's happening between the uh, OASIS group uh, with OSLC. This step standard, really, with this AP233, it, you know, it, it encompasses many of the uh, different disciplines in system engineering across the board, all the way out to uh, manufacturing. But it gives me a place that I can have a standard set of data. If I know a standard set of data, I can come along with any tool and read that set of data uh, and view it any way that I need to slice that. Um, it has many different types of protocols. So if you wanted to store your data in anything that you want to say, okay, I'm going to read it, um, I know if it's 235, then that's going to have engineering properties within it. If it's 233, then it's system engineering, and the format's very specif specific to how that data is stored, so I know how to go and get that data back out again. What's been proposed is, you know, SysML's sitting here, and, and they draw these different diagrams, but then they should store their da diagram data in, the, in a specific format so that the AP233 people can utilize that same information that's being done in our diagram forms, but they'll just uh, to do that. Of course, there's additional stuff that AP233 wants to see that really is not part of what we do in SysML. Like we want to maybe see the issues management or risk management, or we want to see a schedule. Well, we're not really putting those things in a modeling form, but we kind of are. If you look at UAF and other elements, there's some overlap there that can be done. And even any one of these things can be done if we want to extend the SysML language. NAFIMS, which is the International Association for Engineering Modeling Analysis and Simulation Community, which is really IA FEMIS because they've added uh, international instead of national and they added uh, analysis into their group, um, really looks at these all these standards too and tries to figure out what's the best way for engineering modeling analysis and simulation. So when you focus in on what's their available standards that they're looking at, they're looking at the, of course, the AP 233, 233 standards. They're looking at SysML, they're looking at BP, business process modeling notation. They look at the FMI stuff. They, they see what is available for them to do what they need to do their jobs within for simulation analysis. Uh, what's the pros of JP233? It's a standard for data format. It's good for tying data to data. Uh, just that you have to synchronize this data. If you're going from one tool to the next and you want to see information between these sets of things, I've got to synchronize it. Um, and it can get out of date. So you have to worry about when I touched it, what was the last time I touched it, what did I synchronize it, whatever's going on there. You always have those uh, elements. And generation of data typically is slow out of these tools. And so we have to start thinking about, is there a better way to do that? XML, XMI. Well, that's the from the OMG, which is the object management group. It's the standards for all this data modeling. The XMI is their interchange uh, uh, information about how they interchange data in these modeling environments. XML stands for extended markup language. XMI is the XML modeling interchange language. Allows us to figure out what's the format of the data that we want to interchange between modeling environments and any tool vendor that wants to plug into that modeling environment and be able to use that data. Sure, it's the format, and it, and and there is now there's diagram interchange, and so actually you can get into where you can pull data and diagrams using the same standard and say, okay, if it's that, then I know exactly how I'm going to create a viewer if I want to, or my own um, uh, way of looking at the same pieces of data. It looks like this, though. The XML information always shows some kind of a keyword that they're going to put in there, and then the parameters that belong with that, or the attributes that belong with those keywords. Problem is every tool vendor slightly changes those keywords, slightly changes the standard. There's no way that you can write one tool for any all, all tools. XMI is not specific enough to generate from a given modeling any one of these environments to generate XMI, it's extremely slow. You, you click go and you're waiting 15 minutes. And if you wanted to see live data in, uh, interactions between you modeling and doing things, it's just not the way to go here. Functional mockup interface, FMI. Well, it's a, it's a way of getting the information out into a way that I can start to uh, run models, capabilities, structural simulations. Uh, it works like this, where I can create a functional mockup unit 
which consists of a zip file, which is going to have a binary that I would have created of some set of things, and an XML file to defi define what I'm going to do within there. So the FMI and the XML file really become the unit, becomes the, the stuff. The stuff that where they're supporting within here is, uh, you know, they put these um, Java, FMI. These are the different standards that they're doing within the, the MI, FMI group. And they're just saying, what is it they have for interchange? Do I have it available for importing information? Do I have it available for exporting information? Can there be a co-simulation where I'm simulating between two tools and have to be able to see the information while he's actually running at the same time? Yeah, they're working on all these things right now. So I have a set of things for like MATLAB and Simulink. I can actually see that availability of a master-slave uh, co-simulation environment using the FMI so I can go back and forth between tools. Uh, and it's a standard. Uh, it's definitely good for analysis, interchange of information. I can chain together many inputs and outputs. I can put together a lot of tools and have them all tied together. Uh, I, it lets me map my system attributes to some simulation parameters, and I can use value binding to do that in SysML. I am duplicating the data, again, because uh, I have to take it and I have to generate these files and I have to have them out there, uh, not just in my model environment, but I have to actually send them out so they're something that you can read. I don't know when I've updated after I've ran something after execution, so I don't know when to update. And I need to monitor what's going on, so there's always some kind of manual interaction that has to happen here. Tools have different APIs, so that means I can go and use the APIs of the tools to go and pull and push information if I'm trying to get to stuff. Yeah, and, and they look similar, so like one guy will give you some kind of object, and I can get a package, I get a set of classes. Well, the other guy might just give you here is a set of classes just straight off of all of it, so I don't have to go up and down the tree. So they're all different. They're all they're all slightly different. Tool vendors do whatever they want to do within this uh, this world. Um, it's it, the data is heavily tied to the meta structure uh, within any given tool. So you have to know what the meta structure is within SysML to follow what the API is going to go. The tool vendors don't always expose everything either, so you can't always get to what you wanted to get to. And then always you feel like your hands are getting dirty because you're working within their environments and it's always different for every tool vendor. So you've got to go and really go in there and, 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 and work at it. But what's good about it is you get to, I get a direct interface to the data. I can work really fast. I can generate reports. I can do it wherever I want to do really quick because I'm working within the tools environment and I'm going only pulling the pieces of stuff that I want to see for any given thing. Um, this is usually the starting point for most companies when they want to cr jump into something, they want to grab hold of something, and they don't want to wait for a standard um, to show up that's going to give them some kind of data interchange that they can work within. They'll go and just jump into the API and start doing it. Some vendors are better at other than creating their APIs. Like I say, they don't, they don't all expose the same information like they should. If a tool updates, I have to rebuild, so that's a bad thing. I have to rebuild my uh, entire integration suite so that I always work with them. Not everything's available. Some APIs are better than others. Uh, sometimes you don't get the hooks you want to do. Okay, so I can't necessarily say it. And, that it you know, and if I put my stuff and I cause hooks in their system, and I'm listening to things, I can actually slow down everything that's going on. Uh, Oh, and you don't even know if you don't have the data until you actually ask the information from the model. Is the data there? And it tells you, you no, know, there's no data there. And so you actually got to waste your time with uh, extra calls. OSLC, just like URLs, I can do linkage between stuff. So I can not really copy the data, but I'm going to store something that's going to give me a representation to say that it's tied to something else. So I end up with a, a link between items. And I can follow those links. But they have different standards for like architecture management, asset management, automation, change management, and so on. It's going to be those formats for those different standards of whatever you're storing and how you're going to look at that actual string of information that's going to be stored there. Oasis is the group that's defining this information, so it's a different uh, organization. The tool vendors are giving you these OSLC environments, specifically Rhapsody, of course, they're going to give you one, because they call it Jazz. That was their entire thing from 2000 until I think they, they finally maybe dropped the Jazz name off the stuff, off their off their uh, websites. But they're the ones who defined what OSLC is, how it works. They gave it to Oasis to open the standards so that the rest of the communities can start to tie their tools into that same world. Problem is, 
they changed their interfaces after they released the specification, so they're not even they're not even standard to the specification themselves anymore. They have a tool that sits above all the tools and reads the data into the databases and pulls and gets the right reports. And so they're kind of viewing OSLC as they've got a, a dashboard that they've created. PTC, they're making it so they link between the tools of the of the different systems. So if they're here in their requirements tool, they could, they're linking into the modeling environment. So they got they, they store the link there. Modeling is storing the link within the windchill environment. And any one of these environments can ask the other environments for the information that they need to get. So from within, if I'm PLM centric and I want to see for this given part, what's his abstract model, what's his cost, other things like that. Maybe I do the, do the work inside my uh, uh, simulation model. I can I can query that information by uh, running a REST call from one service to the next. But I, I would have the link to the other modeling environment and I can ask his REST, REST information for data back so I can view that stuff uh, and how I uh, feel, uh, feel fit to view that data. Same thing for Mahler. He can have his center point of view and his reports but he's going to have to ask the other two ends for their sets of things. Um, and you have to get the right reports. And so the reports have to be written for each given tool for every given environment that you're trying to do here within the uh, PTC environment. They work with uh, other tools like Mode Frontier and uh, um, Phoenix Integrations, and they use uh, syncing the data a little bit more, um, not so much the FMI yet um, and that I've seen, um, but you'll see that there's a, a way that we synchronize data between the tools. Uh, and, and likewise, with the, with the other tools out there, they also have their solutions that they're trying to do. REST really goes hand in hand with OSLC. REST is a way that you're, after I've stored a link in something, REST is a way that I can query that other tool to give me back those links in a report so that I can actually act on that. So it's a service that's sitting on the other tool's database. I ask that service with a given UI that I'm going to maybe create or get or do something with, uh, even just a dashboard, that I need to ask that service to go and get information from the other tools and pull it like it needs to. It works like this, where I'll have some API service request URL that I'm going to have. I'm going to ask what's the API I'm looking for, what's the methodology I'm looking for, and I'm going to have to pass off some parameters. Well, this methodology and the parameters are purely up to how the each tool vendor wants to wrap his API and his data up to send back in whatever form he chooses to send that data back in. Um, JSON files are similar to XML, that it's going to have some kind of hierarchy within it. Um, but at least if I get a JSON file back from a response, I'm asking for, give me for my system model, uh, show me all the requirements that aren't traced. I would ask the requirements database for all the things that it has. I would list all the things that have linkages in Mahler, I'd have to compare the two lists and then, then list out the ones that don't have any traceability on them. But you'd have to at least ask the report um, information from the requirements tool to give you the full list because you don't know the full list from the system modeling point of view. You only know the things that were linked. URL is the same way. If I wanted to use our URL, it is a web-based thing and I've got some kind of resource I'm gonna ask for and I'm gonna get back whatever we choose again. Images come back, XML, HTML, JSON files again. So it's whatever we choose to at any given time to be able to build those. What's the pros and cons of OSLC? Well, I do, uh, there's, I'm not duplicating work, that's good. I'm just storing a link in other places and so I'm not really copying the data. Uh, if, it, if something changes, I can flag the other tools and so set them up to, to uh, receive a flagged uh, notification that something changed from the last time it was done. So they have to go through and clear it, that's a good thing. I can view the other other tools stuff in a web like view so I can actually if I created in my environments um, a web viewer I can open up in Mahler or in within the uh, Rhapsody I can open a web page and say this is what I see as the other end of the tools data so I can pull up his web page of information and then just walk through however that was built. If I'm trying to get my own point of view of that data though that's where the cons come in. My, my links are stored upstream, so that means I don't know from in my requirements tool what's linked. I don't know that in the tool itself. I have to go and ask the REST services for the right information to get back the right report to give me so I can parse it to say, okay, I can see what's linked. So you have to ask upstream for information that you might want to do when you're in the other tools that you're working within. Um, I don't know about version management. Some of that stuff I've seen is up and up in the air a little bit with the uh, 
the tool vendors that they're solving those problems. I've linked to one thing within CAD and then they do a new version of that uh, assembly that they've drawn and I don't know how to move my thing from one to the other. I don't know how to do mass changes. What if I wanted to turn everything and say lock it down to these versions? How, uh, all these little things need to be written as reports within here. It's not just I linked it, it's that I linked it to a specific one, a specific version, or no, I've linked it and it's just generically fallen in the head. Of course, that's all within the language. This is up to the tool vendor to write the right tools within the tool to handle it. And I can tell you that uh, IBM, who built the stuff, still hasn't even gotten this all right. Uh, they're still working on all these pieces. What's the conclusion of all this? Well, REST needs API normalization, because if you're going to go and swap any tool for any tool, like I said, I want to take out um, uh, doors and I want to, I'm going to put in Lifecycle Manager. Well, that means when I'm asking upstream to whatever tool I was connected to, uh, be it Rhapsody or Nomagic, I wanted to provide back the same API so I can ask the same question without having to rewrite everything I did to get that, uh, that report. Everybody thought OSLC was going to be the, the big solving problem because it's, oh, it's just links. It's going to be great. You can just link, this, link the data. But it really is this REST service that you're really tied to. It's the, how do you get back this list, list of list of stuff and not one by one by one. OSLC, I could ask one by one by one, but that's uh, uh, way too repetitive and uh, too small. So you still need to write these reports, tables, views of data, and, and to get these different points of view. We're going to do that anyway. That's really the future of, yeah, we've modeled. We started putting modeling. We've got these data in here. Now we need to start thinking about what we need to do to, to visualize all this data. Do I need to give everybody systemal points of view with the systemal diagrams? No, not, not necessarily. Sure, i got a relation, relational set of data, and I can show it in a table. I can show it in a different form completely if I want to. But as long as I just show that it's relational data and everybody understands what they're looking at, we're going to be just fine. But there's going to be some combination of approaches that's going to have to be necessary. FMI combined with OSLC, it might be we're using AP233 to store some of the data, to, uh, but we're also still doing linkages when we need to do linkages. This combination is going to have to be done in the, uh, with all these things because I can't see there's one thing that's going to solve all problems, just like there's not one tool that solves all data. There's no one single source of truth. Thank you guys for listening.